All right, everyone, good morning. As you can tell yet again, I still have yet to have a functioning microphone up here for whatever reason. So um, again, if I start getting too quiet for people in the back to start waving me down or something, just so that way I can make sure y'all can all equally hear. I know it can be kind of difficult back there, especially given that we don't have any sort of amplification or anything, which is kind of getting a little ridiculous, but uh, we'll just try to press on and deal with it for now. Uh, again, just kind of doing our general reminders as we get started today. Uh, remember that quiz due is, or sorry, quiz two is due on this Sunday on September 5th at 11.59 p.m. It'll be over the three lectures that we have this week, very similar to the one that we had last week. I saw a lot of y'all did fairly well in the first one. Again, it's a very similar style. It's pretty much questions directly related to stuff that came out of the lecture. Again, it's open notes, so you have access to the PowerPoints and everything, so you know, take advantage of those options. Um, you'll find that the test is very, very similar. Slightly different, but a lot of the questions are almost the exact same questions, just slightly rewritten. Uh, which, again, remember that your first exam, and here's on September 10th, it's going to cover the first five or six chapters, which includes the scientific study of life, the chemistry of life, which we started last week, molecules of life, which we're covering today, cells and energy of life, which is Wednesday and Friday, and then finally photosynthesis and maturation. So it'll be a lot, but we're not going to go back deep into things. We're going to kind of try to keep a fairly surface level view, just because we have a lot of stuff to get through. Um, before I get started, does anybody have any sort of questions or anything like that? All right, perfect. Um, another thing to keep in mind about the exam real quick is remember that again, it is in person, in here. And then you start exactly at 1230 and you'll have exactly 50 minutes to take it. It's 34 questions long. So you have roughly a minute and a half per question. They're all multiple choice. They're not that difficult. Um, honestly, I gave a very similar version of this test last year and the average was like an 89. So it's not that difficult. Bring your own no, no scantrons, but you do need to bring your own pencil, obviously. I'll try to bring a couple just in case people forget, but especially with COVID, it's a little bit more difficult to try to share pencils and stuff like that. So just plan to bring one. Um, but yeah, it, it should have the scantrons inside, and I checked with them this morning on that. So also, if you're SAS, you don't take the test here, you'll actually go to another location and take it there. I'm not exactly sure how the scheduling and all that stuff works, but uh, we'll try to get that stuff all ironed out here. Any other questions real quick? Perfect. So we're gonna do kind of a quick review of chemistry of life real fast, just to like, since a lot of people were kind of struggling with some of the concepts, uh, especially when it came to like ionic versus covalent bonds. And then we're gonna use that and kind of transition into why all that stuff matters. Oh, just a general reminder. Um, if you're sick, just, just stay home. Um, I'm not allowed to just publicly post all the lectures, but if you're sick and I have an excused absence, I can send a link to you, and otherwise it will be on the If you are sick or have a legitimate reason for not being here, you can just let me know and I'll send you I think I've sent about six or seven people that are missing just for very similar reasons. So, all right, just kind of a quick review of last week. Um, just kind of a quick rundown of chemical bonds. You have a covalent bond, which is where atoms are shared, um, share the electrons to achieve a more stable state. Things like methane or what have you, where there's a very minimal difference in electronegativity. And so they're not becoming ions, they're still sharing those electrons between those different uh, elements. You can have two different forms, polar, which is where you have a fairly large difference within electronegativity of a covalent bond. It's all kind of relative, which makes it a bit difficult to discern. Um, and that's going to be things like water. And you can have nonpolar, where there's extremely small differences in electronegativity. And that's something like methane, where you're going to have a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms on the outside. Then you're going to have an ionic bond, which is where one atom takes it away an electron from another, forming ions, where one is positively charged and the other one is negatively charged. And because those ions now have opposite charges from each other, they become bonded together. And then finally, hydrogen bonds which is where the H atoms with a partial positive charge, things like water, are gonna seek out the more negatively charged elements of that same element um, or different elements or different compounds rather. And that's gonna allow, allow them to be partially attracted to the, that negative charged atom of another molecule. 
However, these are extremely weak compared to something like an ionic bond or a covalent bond. And that kind of brings us back to this whole water is essential for life. It's these hydrogen bonds that actually help to hold water molecules together and give water that collection of unique important uh, qualities that allows it to be the way it is. These emergent properties of water is what makes water essential for life. Specifically, it comes down to things like properties such as cohesion, adhesion, the ability to dissolve substances, uh, regulate temperature, expand when it freezes and be a chemical reactant for a product. All of these different things allow uh, are what allow water to be such a crucial part of the chemistry of life. And we'll get more into the specifics of that. I know I just threw them all out here, but bear with me. The cohesion is the tendency for water molecules to stick to one another. Now, hydrogen bonds contribute to a property of this of water called cohesion. Without cohesion, water would instantly evaporate from most locations on Earth. You can actually observe this property when you fill the glass slightly above the rim. The water doesn't quite fill over yet, just yet. It has that little bit of a bubble to it, right? It kind of stands just slightly up top of the, uh, the glass itself. This tendency to hold together at the surface is called surface tension. And that's what's creating it, is that cohesion, that ability to hold together because of those fairly strong, but not strong as say something like a ionic or covalent, but those hydrogen bonds allow it for that cohesion to occur. Water is also adhesive. That means water molecules form these hydrogen bonds with other molecules in a property called adhesion, uh, which is the tendency for water to form uh, hydrogen bonds with substances other than water. Water can soak into a paper towel, forming hydrogen bonds with the molecules that make up the paper towel. And they can be both cohesive and adhesive. So together, cohesion and adhesion allow water molecules to climb from a tree's roots to its highest leaves or allow your blood to be pumped the way it is because it's primarily water with a bunch of other elements and stuff inside of it to give it the, the context that it is. So both adhesion and cohesion allow for water to be transported through plants for photosynthesis to take place. Things like water molecules evaporating from the pores in the leaves because the water stays together, it pulls more water up towards from the ground through the roots. But whereas the adhesion from water within the plant vessels lessen the burden and put the cohesion on to maintain the water flow. In other words, both of these properties act together so that way not only can water move up through the body of the plant pretty easily, but it helps keep the resistance down from like acting against other things. Water is also an excellent solvent. Um, this is another reason why water is vital to life and it helps dissolve a wide variety of chemicals and helps to say transport things through the leaves. For instance, it's not just water that's in your blood, right? There's a bunch of nutrients in there. There's abundance of quite a other bunch of different things. Without having that, that ability of water to move that stuff around because it's an excellent solvent, you wouldn't be able to do most of these things. Um, it's primarily gonna dissolve um, what we call water loving substances or hydrophilic. Um, philic means loving, phobic means hating or fearful of. So if you ever see those terms come up, like I'm sure you've heard terms like homophobia thrown around, fear of gay people, right? That's where those bases are coming from. Um, but that's kind of what you've got going on there where you've got this hydrophilicness of water that allows you to pull apart polar solutes and allows ions to be suspended within the water itself. This polarity of water molecules helps water dissolve most biologically important molecules since many of them are hydrophilic. There's very few that are hydrophobic but we'll talk about more of those in a second. Water also helps to dissolve things like salt. So salt generally has a slightly negative charge. Um, sorry, the, the water itself has a slightly negative charge, which helps to attract things like sodium ions that are gonna be slightly positive charged and pull them out and put them into solution. And because of that slight positive charge, it breaks that connection between the chlorine ions and the uh, sodium ions and allows them to just kind of dissociate into solution. Water also has some other unique properties in that it helps to regulate temperature. Hydrogen bonds make water resistant to changes in temperature. So as water cools and heats up very slowly because of these hydrogen bonds, it takes more energy to excite it or to slow it down than it does other things, or than other things do. This is why coastal regions have mild temperatures 
I'm sure you all have noticed this coming from, you know, if you've been out on the beaches, say at Cocoa Beach or Vero or Daytona, and then come inland, you'll notice that it feels a lot cooler over there. And it's because that ocean uh, sits there and acts as a sink for all that extra heat. And so it doesn't warm up nearly as badly over there compared to in the middle of uh, Orlando, where all it is is just uh, blacktop and all that kind of fun stuff. So it just sucks up the heat and makes it absolutely unbearable some days. Um, you especially notice this if you ever move outside of Florida, go to places like Georgia or Alabama, where you get outside in the sun and it has about the same level of humidity, but it is scorching hot compared to being out on the beach. And it's just because there's, there's nothing to break up that, um, all that water when you're sitting next to it just absorbs a lot more of the energy and it takes more for it to heat up than say the dirt or the air around you. Water also expands when it freezes. It's one of the very few compounds that does this. Most things as you move from a gas to a, a liquid to a solid compress, whereas water expands when it freezes, which is rather odd. Hydrogen bonds make water molecules spread out like this when it freezes into ice. And this is why ice is less dense than liquid water and allows ice to float on top. That floating ice can completely change the entire climate just because that little bit of extra barrier between the sun and the water itself, especially when you have a solid white barrier like that helps to reflect back sunlight and you know, absorb less energy and not warm that area up as much. So in large bodies of water, that top layer of ice is providing insulation, keeping the rest of everything from else from freezing. And thus it's possible for aquatic life to survive under winter. So basically by pushing away all that, uh, keeping everything kind of nice and insulated underneath, things like beluga whales, narwhals, all that kind of fun stuff that lives up in the Arctic Circle, and still continue to hunt underneath that ice, but it keeps the whole area from warming up too much because it's reflecting back a lot of the sunlight as well. So it's kind of insulating the water and it's insulating everything else. Water is also very important because it participates in a variety of different chemical reactions. Uh, now, remember, a chemical reaction occurs when you have two or more molecules and the reactants exchange their atoms, resulting in different molecules or products. Things uh, that are a great example for this, particularly for water, is photosynthesis and respiration. Two of the most crucial processes in life are directly caused, use water as a main source of how they undergo it. Respiration, you're giving off water usually by the creation of um, hydrogen and and oxygen atoms or, uh, compounds coming together, whereas photosynthesis is the opposite, where you're taking in water to break things down. All right, so let's do another little quick review question here. Which property contributes to the high surface tension of water? Hydrogen bonding, polar covalent bonds, cohesion, polar covalent bonds, and cohesion, or E, all of the choices are correct. How many of y'all think it's A? What about B? C? D? What about E? Exactly. It's all of these things working together that ultimately result in cohesion happening. Because you can't have cohesion without those hydrogen bonds and those covalent bonds playing a major role. So it's a little bit of a tricky question, but yeah, all of them are correct. All right, pretty straightforward. All right, now cells have to have an optimum pH. Now the pH scale is based off of how many hydrogen ions are in solution. So remember back to the fact that water is really good solute or a, a solute to break things into solution. Um, there's a lot of other solutions as well that you can test pH for, but obviously it's kind of easier to just think about it in terms of water. Now, most chemical reactions in the cell occur around a pH of seven. So that means your body's going to have to maintain that pH of seven through a variety of different reactions itself, just to allow the chemical reactions needed to function to happen. Now, one of the most important substances dissolved in water is simply these H plus ions. These H plus ions are stripped of their electrons, which, electrons, which basically turns them into a single proton. And too much or too little of these hydrogen protons can result or can ruin the shape of critical molecules inside a cell, making them completely non-functional. Uh, so the source of hydrogen ions is usually from pure water, 
which uh, spritz out continuously producing H plus and hydroxide ions, which we'll talk a little bit more about, I'm sure at some point. And if there's a lot of H plus ions, it's considered a low acidic, or it's considered highly acidic. But if you have a low con concentration of H plus ions, it's considered highly basic. Now this pH scale shows the amount of H plus ions in solution. So again, the fewer you have, the more basic you're going to be, but the more uh, H plus ions you have, the more acidic you're going to be. So it, it's all kind of relative. So remember going from six to seven, is it just, it's all logarithmic, which means you're going from one to 10 in a difference in concentration. So instead of having one person in a room, you're going to 10 people in a room. And so from going from seven to five, you're going from one to a hundred, that kind of a change. So these changes are fairly drastic. So even a slight difference between four and a half and five and a half is huge in the grand scheme of things. Um, and a lot of these things can be very, how, how acidic or how basic an item is can really um, influence how it reacts in certain circumstances. You know, for instance, things like uh, stomach acid is going to be a pH of around 1.6 to 1.8, so it's very, very acidic. We get something like lemon juice is typical. And then you get things like milk, which is around a six. Um, pure water is seven. Bleach gets almost down to 13, if I remember correctly. And then just pure NaOH sodium hydroxide is 14 versus hydrochloric acid, which is just pure H ions at that point, um, is around a pH of zero. And you do not want to mess with that. That's the kind of acid that you associate with like melting through skin and that kind of stuff. Really nasty shit. Now, organisms have to balance their acids and bases. So if an organism strays too far from its optimal pH, it can likely die. And certain conditions allow for pHs to, you know, cause an organism to flourish or cause it to just completely wink out of a system. Um, a cool example of this is the pathogen that I study. Um, it's kind of like the alien from aliens, where it basically will burrow into the liver of a tadpole, eat through all the tissue, and then burst out. Really kind of dark and meta. But... Um, What's kind of interesting about it is it only works at certain pHs. Basically, there's this like perfect bell curve where around a pH of 6.5, uh, the little spores hatch out and just consume everything. Whereas if you increase it to seven, maybe get 50% of them to hatch. You go beyond that, they just don't hatch at all and none of the animals live. And what's really cool is we believe this is an evolutionary relationship with this particular protist where basically what happens in these systems is they're a base uh, pH of about four and a half. But when big rainstorms come through, it brings up the pH to something like six and a half, seven, because you're getting a lot more pure water into that system. It increases the pH of that system. And as a result, it causes those spores to realize, oh, here's my perfect conditions. It's time to hatch. Now, one of the really cool things that also is happening during this exact same time period as frogs are attuned to the rain as it comes in. So if you've ever noticed after a big rainstorm, you're walking around and all these little toads are hopping out, they, they know that it's rained and they're using that to time, okay, I need to go to a pond and breathe. And so this protus is perfectly timed in based off of the pH of a system to attack at the exact moment that these frogs and other amphibians are coming into these wetlands to breathe. Really cool system. Now, in order to kind of keep these organisms aligned though, and kind of handle situations when they're not at their optimal pH, you have to use these buffer solutions. So for instance, when pH is too high, buffers will release uh, these hydrogen ions to lower the pH. However, when the pH is too low, the buffers will absorb hydrogen ions to raise the pH of the system and keep it as close to neutral as possible. Let's do another quick review question here. Which of these is the most acidic solution? An H plus concentration of 10 to the minus two, a pH of 12, an H plus concentration of 10 to the minus 12, an HOH concentration that is equal to the H plus concentration, or a pH of three. Now that's kind of a lot of weird ways to write it, but just remember that, you know, H plus concentration being two to the 10 minus zero, or to the negative two, is equivalent of it being two, right? 
So who thinks it's A? Most of y'all, good. Uh, B, C, D, or E, All right? It's pretty straightforward, it's A. Um, in this case, because A has got a pH of two, B has a pH of 12, C has a pH of 12 as well, D has a pH of seven because they're exactly equal, right? So they're, it's right at neutral. And finally, a pH of three, so it's still lower than two, or still higher than two, so that, that's why it's not three. Everybody good with that? Here, again, I'm sorry, I know a lot of this stuff is review. Bear with me. I promise it's important to like set, start setting things up. Now, here's where we dive into what all of this means for biology and why all this stuff is important. Now, remember that while organisms are mostly composed of water, they're also composed of a lot of other things, such as organic molecules. And these organic molecules are compounds that contain both carbon and hydrogen. Now that word organic has a lot of different meanings. And obviously uh, when it comes to like botanical concepts, it means you're not using you know, pesticides or whatever. But here in this case, we're talking about purely a chemistry based approach, which means that chemically it has to have carbon atoms in it. So in this case, if you're talking from purely a chemical perspective, all food is organic. However, you know, if you're a farmer or a consumer of organic foods, it's all those standards are set by USDA as far as like what defines truly from a botanical or a, you know, food sciences perspective, what is organic versus not organic. Um, but uh, ultimately what we need to remember here is that these organic molecules contain both carbon and hydrogen and methane is the most simple form of it. Where you've just got this single carbon atom with four different hydrogen atoms and that's what's gonna be your just most basic form. Now, organic molecules are incredibly biologically important. And there's four kind of big categories that we process them into. That's simply carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Now, all of these kind of have base forms and kind of expanded forms, if you will, where you say, okay, a protein is made out of a bunch of amino acids put together. Or nucleic acids are made out of a bunch of either deoxyribose or um, just ribose nucleic acid, that kind of thing. Now, carbon and hydrogen chains and rings are differentiated by the chemically reactive groups such as hydroxyls, carboxyls, amino and phosphate. Again, we're not gonna go super hard into this, just kind of keep this in the back of your head. These are the things that kind of change these simple you know, carbon with a couple of hydrogens on them into other things. Like for instance, deoxyribose nucleic acid um, has a bunch of other crap sticking on the outside of it that changes it into a different thing. Now, one of the things I kind of, on there a second ago was that organic molecules are made of something called a monomer. Now this monomer is a single unit of something, whether it be a carbohydrate, a protein, or a nucleic acid. And these monomers are what are gonna to form together in different ways, shapes, and forms to form the polymers. So mono, single, polymer, multi. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, yes, but it's slightly different. Um, they're kind of, their structure is a lot more complicated to describe, but yeah, they do have somewhat of a monomer, polymer aspect to it, but we're not going to cover it here. So you have two different things that can create, uh, create or destroy monomers into polymers. So you have dehydration synthesis, which is where you're joining monomers together. This is a type of chemical reaction and it's ultimately used to synthesize a polymer and enzymes form bond between the two monomers together, and that's what's actually gonna generate that polymer. So synthesis coming together, right? Um, and as a part of this reaction, you need water to be released. That's why it's called the dehydration uh, synthesis, because when you're putting these two monomers together, you're pulling a water out of it. You're dehydrating that molecule. Does that make sense? And then you have hydrolysis which is gonna break polymers up into monomers. 
Now hydrolysis is again, another type of chemical reaction. This is used to digest or break down polymers and the enzymes that break bonds between monomers are considered hydro hydraulic uh, enzymes. And when you do this, it actually takes a water molecule to bring into that reaction. It's hydrolysis, water cutting. Does that make a little bit more sense? So um, I know it's a lot of like base words. There's some really good examples out there of just like, if you want it, like these like just lists of Latin words that if you ever see them like hydro, you always know it's associated with water, lysis, cutting, that kind of thing. Now remember that organic molecules are in all of our food. So carb carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are common in all of our diets. Some of these are considered healthy based off of how they're structured, while others are associated with obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Uh, for instance, both starches, uh, such as can be found in French fries, and cellulose, which can be found in things like lettuce, are carbohydrates. But lettuce is clearly healthier because of uh, the way that those carbohydrates are formed within that um, particular molecule. Uh, more specifically, cellulose, which is also considered a fiber, is not as easily digested. And so that's why you're not taking up a lot of that carbohydrate itself. You're not really getting much energy from it which can be both good and bad, depending on the context. Um, so we'll kind of jump into these different categories here a little bit, just to kind of make things a little bit easier. The first thing we're gonna start with is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are your basic, your simple sugars or your polysaccharides or your you know, more complex sugars. Now your monosaccharides, you know, say one sugar, are simple sugars, they are monomers, and that's what's actually going to build up these carbohydrates into their polymer form. Things like ribose, which is at the you know, cornerstone of your DNA backbone, glucose and fructose are the most common examples of these uh, monosaccharides. And the way that those differ, because they just have this fairly basic shape where they have either five or six um, ele or elements at the center of the compound, and then you have these weird things that stick onto the outside of them. That's what defines them as being either a fructose or a glucose. So if you look, fructose and glucose both have the same exact chemical composition of C6H12O6, but it's these weird outside groups that are what gonna change how those things fit together. And you can, and I kind of mentioned this on Friday, there's something called chiral where the shape of it, it's kind of like how your hands are completely opposite right? You have your handprint that's facing that way and your handprint that's facing that way. Uh, but they're all, the direction you have to like look at a different version of it. You can't just be like, yeah, it's the exact same thing because there's a side to it, right? Now dehydration synthesis is going to bind two monosaccharides together to form a disaccharide, two sugars. And sucrose, in, for, in this instance, is considered a disaccharide. You see, you can have Now you can actually use hydrolysis to also separate these disaccharides into monosaccharides as well. Now polysaccharides can form huge long chains and the longer they are and the more dense they are, especially if you look at something like cellulose, it's kind of like a long structure that's all going to be a little bit different. They're going to be separated into The more they are to break apart, the more likely it is that you're not going to be able to break it apart during your digestive process. That's why things like cellulose compared to something like glycogen are going to be much easier to break apart and actually use that carbohydrate to your advantage. Um, the big thing I do want to point out though is keep in mind too, all of these are still made of glucose or some other basic monosaccharide. It's just how they're assembled together is what gives you these different types of uh, polysaccharides. Moving on to our next one, proteins. They have a very uh, different structures and functions depending on the certain circumstances that you're going to be interacting with them with. Um, and these structural changes, when if, particularly when they become a polymer, is what allows proteins to act the way they do in certain circumstances. So these proteins are the workers of the cell. They're what's going to do primarily everything that's going on within a cell. They're going to, you know, move enzymes around. Um, there's a really cool video of this uh, 
protein, and I, I'll have to find it and post it to the canvas, but it's basically these long strips of carbohydrate um, structures inside of a cell that form the backbone of almost kind of like a skeleton inside. For this, you, but you can watch this protein as it literally like steps up and down this thing to move uh, things from one side of the cell to the other. It's really cool. Um, proteins like collagen or like collagen create cellular structures and proteins like actin and myosin produce muscle contractions. So they have various different functions based off of, you know, how they're structured and all that kind of good stuff. Now proteins, their monomer is amino acids. There's 20 different kinds of amino acids in nature and all amino acids have the same general structure. However, the way that they're different is based off of the stuff that's on the outside of them. So here you have the amino acid and the monomer. We'll talk a lot about this a lot more later uh, when we get to uh, DNA and RNA. And we'll talk about how basically your DNA tells your, or basically is your, your blueprints. Your RNA is the instructions from those blueprints. And then that RNA is then turned into proteins based off of how this amino acid is told it to be constructed. It's, it's called the, the central dogma of biology. And we'll get a lot more into that, but just know that for now, all these different combinations of amino acids are what shapes that protein and what allows it to kind of fold in the way it does and react the way it does. Now with these R groups, some are polar, some are nonpolar, some are charged, some aren't. Some are small, some are medium, some are bulky. But again, as you change these R groups out is what's gonna change the property of the overall amino acid, which is gonna change the overall properties of the protein itself when it all comes together. Now, like everything else, proteins are synthesized and broken down. You need dehydration synthesis to bind two amino acids together. That's gonna to form what we call a dipeptide, two peptides as shown below. So you've got these two amino acids that are being bonded together through uh, dehydration synthesis. They go back the other way, you're gonna use hydrolysis where you need to add that water to it to cut them apart. Pretty straightforward, right? I know it's a lot of the same kind of stuff, just in different forms. It's a lot of vocabulary. So flashcards might be your friend for this part for the exam. Now these polypeptides fold up into protein. You can have a lot of different forms based off of how heat's applied to them, whether certain enzymes are applied to them, and a bunch of different things. So these chains of amino acids fold into unique 3D shapes to become a protein itself. So here you can actually see one of the common processes below. It can take years to learn some of the most basic folding patterns explicitly just based off the chemistry. You're not going to need to know that. Just know that they do fold up based off of how the amino acids are there. Um, the function of this protein depends on its shape, or what we call its tertiary structure. So not only are we talking about just flat on the page, here's the elements that make it up of all these different molecules, but how are they all folded together makes a huge contributing part of this. Now, denatured proteins can lose their shape. How many of y'all are familiar with Alton Brown? Wonderful UGA alumni, actually came and spoke at my uh, graduation. So really cool guy. Check his stuff out though if you're not familiar with him. There's a really cool way of like introducing the amount of chemistry behind cooking works. You can actually get really good at like style and food. Uh, but for instance, here in this example, you have eggs, right? So when you first crack open an egg, it's kind of runny and all this kind of fun stuff. But when you heat it up, that's going to denature the protein, and that's what's going to give you that kind of classic sunny side uh, look to it. He does a much better explanation of it, so check it out. But this primary and secondary structure is simply just your amino acid sequence. Your secondary structure is the localized area coils and that tertiary structure is all of those foldings together. You don't really need to know much about this. Just know that there's different levels of protein structure. The primary one is just simply what makes up, what makes up that protein. Secondary is how it initially starts folding and tertiary is where it has that full foldings in and back on itself. And again, People spend entire courses just talking about that. We're not gonna really get too heavily into it. But this is where that tertiary and quaternary structure comes in. We're taking 
Sort of amino acids, which is kind of cool if you think about it. Finally, um, well, well, not quite finally, we're getting to our second to last one, uh, nucleic acids, which carry genetic information. DNA in humans, at least, is considered almost to be like the blueprints of our body. It can be changed over time as we continue to exist, but for the most part, it's pretty much set from birth. Uh, nucleic acids includes things like DNA and RNA, and the primary structure of each protein in a cell is determined by the nucleic acids itself. Basically, the nucleic acids are going to tell what all the mechanisms to create proteins, how to build them the proper way. And again, we'll get more into the weeds on that in another time. Here's what you have for these monomers and nucleic acids. Everything else, here in this case, you have a pure base that I think is the DNA. Um, you have a phosphate group that's here, which is deoxyribose, so that's where the DNA is going to come from. And then you have this nitrogen base. That's what gives you your base. One type of base from it. All three parts of these nucleotides are a phosphate group a five carbon sugar in that nitrogen space. And you need all three of these things together to form that single monomer for your nucle uh, nucleotides. Now the type of nucleotide differs between whether you're talking about DNA or RNA. In RNA, you have four, just like you have in DNA, but the thymine or the T that you associate with the uh, nitrogen spaces is replaced with something called uracil or U is kind of usually how you see it written out. So the DNA and RNA are, are incorporate adenine, cytosine, and guanine. So A, C, and G. DNA only has, or DNA has thymine, and uracil only has uh, is only found in RNA. And you have these five different types of nucleotides that are then all assembled together, which basically kind of acts as a functioning language for your body to interpret or your cells to interpret what proteins you need at a particular location and how the protein should be constructed. Like everything else, dehydration synthesis binds two nucleotides together, forming a dipeptide, two peptides. And shown below, DNA or RNA are long chains of nucleotides together. Now, if you want to separate them, you use hydrolysis, which again, you have to take in water to do, but again, pretty straightforward. Now, DNA and RNA are considered nucleic acids. So DNA is going to be double helix, which means that you're going to get that classic structure you always associate with DNA, right? Where you have the two ladders that are kind of spinning together. RNA can be sing is primarily single-stranded. Um, when you're talking about DNA, the nitrogen spaces are held together by hydrogen bonds, and it's going to include A, T, Cs, and Gs. And its primary function is to store genetic information. Whereas in RNA, you're going to have the nitrogen spaces A, U, G, and C. And its primary function is to carry, D, carry DNA information to protein synthesizing organelles. Now, one thing I do want to kind of clarify here is keep in mind there are RNA-focused viruses, and but there are no RNA-focused bacteria. All living creatures have DNA at some point. Things like viruses, which are kind of like right on the edge, but not truly living. The reason why they only have RNA is because that's all they've needed to exist, right? Because if you just slightly modify those RNA, which is a lot more vulnerable ultimately, and that's why we don't use RNA for everything. Um, that's what's gonna allow them to evolve. But then again, they also can't use it to like build stuff for themselves. That makes sense. All right. So we're gonna get to our final um, kind of main uh, or compound needed for life. That's lipids. This is the only thing that's going to be primarily hydrophobic when it comes to uh, kind of in a general big picture sense of like what defines the compounds of your body. This is going to be the, pretty much the only one that's hydrophobic. Now, all lipids are hydrophobic and different groups of lipids include things like molecules with varying structures and functions. However, unlike carbohydrates and proteins and nucleic acids, lipids are not built from chains of monomers. Some have slightly different things that almost kind of look like monomers, but they're a little different. Um, 
Lipids are again organic compounds with the same with one common property in that they do not dissolve in water. And they're built of these C and C and H hydrogen bonds. Now, lipids are divided into different classes. Are energy rich, and we need them for long term energy storage. Like, you have to have some fat on your body, or you will die because it's needed for things like. Uh, your different organs. If you ever have a circumstance where you go more than a couple hours without eating, you need to have that somewhat of a long-term storage there to have as a backup. You don't need a ton, but you do need some. Um, and then you have fats and other or lipids that show up in other ways. Things like steroids are another class of lipid, and they have this really cool forming structure. Look totally different. Now, speaking more specifically about triglycerides, um, they're formed by covalently attaching three fatty acid molecules to a glycerol molecule. That's where I said that it was kind of like a monomer, but it's a monomer combination, but it's not a true one. So you have these long chains that you have together. That's what creates the glycerol triglycerides. I'm sorry, triglycerides. Um, however, and again, you use dehydrase and synthesis to link all these things together, so that, where, and hydrolysis to break it apart. So it's very similar, but not quite the same. Now, some fatty acids are what we call saturated. That basically means all the, um, the bonds themselves are like super well kind of all connected, and nice and straight, and perfect like this. Which means the they kind of fit nicely in a row, and that's probably why you would avoid them for the most part, because if you eat a bunch of these, they're much easier to stack, much easier to incorporate without kind of having to restructure and reshape. Whereas you get to um, unsaturated fats, things like you see in this vegetable oil, that's where you get that kind of, if you smell where that's why it is that way. And then you get things like trans fat, which are just these solid at room temperature, perfectly straight, perfectly simple. And, and that's why they kind of tell you to avoid those things. Because they're a lot easier for your body to uptake and use and most likely store. Now, these unsaturated fatty acids are based off of the single double bond, which gives that fatty acid that bent shape. And the saturation gives triglycerides different properties. So the bends in the unsaturated fatty acids prevent them from packing close together. Unsaturated fats like oils are therefore uh, liquids at room temperature. That's why they are the way they are. Now, steroids, ugh, steroids are the second class of lipids. They're a really important lipid molecule. You're going to find them in just about every part of your body. Pretty much any hormone that you have is considered a steroid. Um, things like testosterone, estrogen, LPH, uh, HGH, a lot of that stuff is all controlled by these very small, odd looking lipids that are allowing your body to like tell your other parts of your body what to do. All right, so we have one more review question and then I should be able to get you guys out of here. All right, so quick review question. Which monomer is incorrectly paired? A, protein and monopeptide, B, carbohydrate and monosaccharide, C, nucleic acid and nucleotide, or D, lipid and no monomer? Who thinks it's A, B, C, D? Yeah, it's A. Uh, again, what is what is the monomer for proteins? All right. Again, remember, quiz at the end of the week, test next Friday. Not on the top, not.